I think the holy grail of unlocking true operational efficiencies has a lot to do with working across the organization and being the glue that really brings people together. And I've been in the, in sort of like the sales ops now, revenue ops role for um, 10 plus years. And I think a, a lot of things have changed and a lot of things haven't and kind of stayed the same. Uh, like the core of what we do and some of the um, sort of the, the setup and the intent of it is quite consistent, but obviously the way that we approach certain situations, the internal and external stakeholders and systems that we use very greatly. Um, and at the end of the day, I think um, it's quite a dynamic field. Um, I think, uh, especially when we move into a virtual first selling model, there's a lot of challenges and sort of interesting situations that come out of that. But at the same time, um, I would say the basics of how uh, uh, you know processes um, and flows and and really cadences are run are probably staying for the most part pretty consistent. Yeah, great, good. It's good to have a consistent process. So that makes sense. Um, one of the things you mentioned there is that our relationships with internal stakeholders has changed, and this is something we hear a lot about, especially ops becoming more strategic, for example, or. Um, involved in different types of discussions. What have you seen there, Ganka? Um, and what's been the root cause of why some of this stuff is happening? Yeah, I think it's a combination of like the evolution of um, sales operations into revenue operations as a function. And then also the relationship that then that sort of uh, the expansion of those relationships outside of just the core sales team into marketing, into CS, and really beyond go to market into product and engineering. I think like the, the holy grail of unlocking like true operational efficiencies has a lot to do with working across the organization and being sort of that uh, uh, in between um, in the glue that, that really brings people together and conversations, uh, you know, usually based on data. So it's, uh, it's sort of like layers of providing the data and then sort of leading that to commentary conversation and therefore decisions. Um, so I think that's that sort of type of evolution that we've seen um, and then we'll continue to see. Uh, obviously, I think, you know, it, with the caveat of depending on the size of the organization, I think smaller organizations are more nimble and have the opportunity to be a lot better connected um, and um, to sort of work closely together. But they, they think, I think there's a lot to say about um, sort of, yeah, the role of operations and really the idea of the importance of it. Um, I personally have seen such a, a expansion in conversations and um, sort of uh, professionals that are coming into operations from different functions. And I think that probably elevates the function as well. Okay, yeah. It's really interesting what parts people take into the role. Now, one of the things you mentioned there is different layers um, that Ops is now interacting with. And it's a great thing to think about for forecasting. So first of all, who does forecasting responsibility fall on? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and uh, really, I think the way that I think of it is like a two part. Uh, the responsibility of being prepared and coming into the, you know, let's think about like a simple forecast meeting is obviously on sales leadership and operations who provide the data. Um, and like the way that I think of that group of people is the hosts, but then you have the audience, right, which is the rest of the organization that happens to be on that call that could potentially be influential and benefit from the knowledge that, we're, that is being shared. Um, so those would be like the way that I would think of like a forecasting sort of uh, model, if you will. Yeah, I love that. And would the hope with the um, uh, would the participants be reps? If we had a part of the reps, for sure. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, you made a great point there, but these are our reps. These are people who could really benefit from the data. 
getting reps to be data led, however, is a whole conversation in itself. And it's something that can be challenging. Um, how do we make sure our reps have awesome forecasts? They're informed by the data, so they're informed and listening to ops and they see them as a partner, referencing a bit your point earlier there. Yeah, I think it, it always comes down to what's in it for me. Um, that principle uh, tested in, uh, and uh, I think uh, proven to be quite uh, applicable in many situations. But really, I think at the end of the day, uh, the importance um, of uh, an accurate forecast, it kind of goes both ways. For them, I think um, the opportunity to be able to um, surface any uh, detail, any deals that are at risk or that uh, might need attention from the broader team. Um, and uh, also like understanding that um, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's a consistency that we're after predictability and relying on some of the historic learnings, applying them to, to where the data is taking us today and um, kind of taking it from there. Absolutely. Um, predictability, consistency, massive things for sales teams to achieve. Um, tell me a bit more about how forecasting plays into the consistency and predictability piece, which is so important, especially for SaaS companies to get right. I'm sorry, you broke up a bit there. Apologies. You mentioned predictability and you mentioned consistency. Mm -hmm. um, we would love to hear how those two themes are, are impacted by forecasting, how these things work together. Yeah, I mean, it really all starts at the, the top, if you will, with what cadence do you have, who your attendees are, and what learnings you have from um, historic uh, findings. What methods do you currently run with and yeah. why did you choose them? Yeah, absolutely. So we run a couple of different things, uh, a more traditional forecasting method where we have, uh, you know, we, we kind of pay attention to what's happening in the current quarter. Uh, we meet on a weekly basis uh, in sort of two different formats. One is just the leadership team. And then every other week we meet with the reps. Again, I think I mentioned that earlier, but size of organization really matters in how you decide to set up your forecasting cadence. And part of that is obviously how big is the group and how important is it that, um, you know, you have uh, cer certain attendees there or can you have like regional representation and kind of uh, um, just go with that. Um, we also have, uh, you know, uh, depending on the organizational size and the maturity, like I've seen this kind of evolve quite a bit throughout the years um, in different organizations. Um, and um, at the end of the day, it's, uh, you know, we, we look to, to a couple of different things. Um, a call number from the account executive, which is basically what are their, what are their expectations um, of their own performance for this quarter. We look at um, uh, commit. So we use forecast categories in Salesforce, pretty straightforward there. And then we also have um, sort of the concept of allowing our, our leadership team and our managers to adjust things slightly on their end, because I think at the end of the day, you know, running a region, running a territory, you usually have a, a slightly different idea of how you see things and where you see potential, uh, you know, opportunities drop or probably come in that haven't been in, put in pipeline yet. So it's a it's a little bit of a combination there. Um, but really, the idea is to kind of align between our sales teams, our channel team as well, depending on whether or not, obviously, you have a partnership program. Um, there's a little bit of a different element when it comes to channel sales versus direct sales. So um, really, the idea of like bringing kind of everyone to the table and making sure that everyone is comfortable with wh where we're going and what we're committing. Okay, that's, that's great, Ganka. We learned a lot about processing cadence there. Um, what single process or single part of a process have you seen being most instrumental in, in its impact? That's a good question. I mean, there's so many little things that you can do that incrementally and over time will be quite impactful. Um, I think at the end of the day, like the, the basic idea of because we're expecting consistency and predictability, 
um, some sort of commit uh, at a time in the quarter that is sort of like, this is what we're gonna be measured against is probably uh, one of the things that works quite well. Um, we do that here at the beginning of the second month of a quarter, uh, which is probably around the right time to kind of get have confidence in what's going on with your pipeline and what would be the what you're predicting to be the end result um, in a couple of months. Okay, that's fantastic. So we've learned all about um, how forecast processes work, who's in control of them. Let's think slightly bigger picture here. What's it all about? Why do we forecast specifically? What outcomes do we expect from forecasting? Yeah, a couple of things. I mean, uh, I think depending on your audience, again, you probably have different outcomes that you're after. I think about um, obviously sales leadership uh, and go to market leadership in general. Um, obviously, just a pure understanding of what's happening within specific deals and also within specific regions. Um, I also think about our um, C team and uh, we have a, an executive sponsorship program, for example. So the deals that they're involved with or where else can they contribute um, as sort of stewards of our organization? I think that's pretty uh, impactful. And then the last bit, I mentioned that when we talked about sort of the expansion of the sales operation, revenue operations role in general is this idea of um, product, uh, your product team actually hearing the feedback that's coming from the field, um, understanding what are some of the challenges that we might have um, out there and potentially like how often do we run into them and is that impactful enough to, to make any changes? Okay, so it means different things to different layers mm -hmm. and people in the organization. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So if we were to really summarize what success could look at, uh, sorry, what success could look like, mm -hmm. um, you know, let's go from the right to the top, to the middle, to the bottom view. How does success change through each layer of the organization? Yeah, I mean, success is probably accuracy. Um, I spoke into a friend of mine who a, runs a, um, significant um, sales organization. And one of the things he often talks about is no surprises. And really that, that sort of, I think, encompasses it um, in terms of, it's always great when you, you close a deal that wasn't uh, committed, but it's also surprising. <laughs> and obviously the opposite scenario is not the best thing that you can, uh, you can go through. So it's, uh, um, I think that is kind of like the overarching, uh, if you will, theme and sort of uh, goal that I think we're all after. But um, I would say too, is um, the idea of, um, of learning what's, what's, out, what's happening in the field and having that sort of contact um, with uh, you know, the people that speak to prospects and clients all the time. I think that's quite beneficial to the broader organization either way. And then, um, you know, obviously taking those learnings, we have uh, a, a lot of different uh, opportunities to make changes in the organization and over time to, to get better at um, what we all do uh, to, to really support um, the progression of our business. Okay, that's a great point. That first thing you said there, no surprises. It's back to that repeatability. Um, kind of piece we said at the beginning so it's, it's interesting that comes up again yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think it's um it's sort of a theme right you think about what would be the ideal outcome of uh of what we do here and why um, we sort of look at so much data and we try to predict um and also understand the current state and yeah i think it's it's just at the end of the day really the the significance of all this work is uh found in in the outcome yeah Awesome. Yeah, really great point. Okay. Um, so if you were to do forecasting and process all over again, mm -hmm. completely from scratch, or if you were maybe talking to someone brand new to ops, what are some key lessons you think you would take away <laughs> or you would teach them or you're trying to yeah. avoid doing? Yeah. Um, there are a few things that come to mind. I think 
one would have to be the cadence, right? Um, I think it's it's how often do you do you meet? How do you prepare? Who sort of owns um, all of the bits and pieces that um, come with forecasting? Uh, who are your attendees? Um, and really sort of like the, the operational aspect of forecasting. And then you think about systems and um, analytics in general, right? And how pr predictive analytics, uh, Tableau, CRM, anything can really sort of accelerate that process and give you more comfort in what's actually happening. Um, um, I would also say that um, working really closely with your sales leadership team, aligning on the goals of the, the forecast uh, meetings and really sort of making sure that everyone's on the same page as to why um, this is important, but also how do we want to present? What are the things that we want to focus on? Um, we currently sort of prepare a mini deck for our sales leadership team for every um, forecast call because we find that to be quite helpful in setting the tone of the meeting and sort of giving us a, a very high level understanding of where we are. And then we kind of dig deeper into um, specific things like uh, pipeline changes and pipeline, pipeline movement over the last week. So really like, I, I think it's, a, it's sort of like a fine balance between the big picture and sort of this is what everyone in the business um, that is on this call needs to know and needs to understand. And then the specifics of uh, the deals themselves, what is at risk, what's going well, and then uh, what's happened in the last week and maybe what are some of the changes that um, uh, basically impacted the, uh, the, the current state of the, of the forecast. Um, so there's a lot of really neat ways to present data. There's a lot of neat ways to work with your sales leadership team to ensure that they're comfortable and prepared and have commentary that's appropriate. And then when it comes down to working with your account executives, I mean, at the end of the day, for them, it's an opportunity to come prepared, um, to really align with the broader organization and seek help when, where needed. Um, and I think, you know, kind of understanding what everyone's motivated by will make that process a little bit easier and, um, you know, really building that that sort of uh, uh, idea of how you want to to operate and have a forecast uh, go really okay what well, one of the really great themes you've highlighted in this interview Ganka, is how forecasts mean different things for different people in the business and we need to adjust what we're saying to reflect that um so just wanted to note that's a super interesting thing that's come out of this um is there anything in the world of forecasting that you don't think is spoken about often enough in sales operations or in a business, maybe different colleagues or peers that you speak to, or even in this interview? Huh. I don't know. I mean, I think that, that people have spent plenty of time thinking and talking about this topic, but the way that I think of forecasting is probably like, it's just the one sort of element of what you do um, in an organization, right? From a from an analysis perspective and a pipeline analysis. And really what I mean by that, I think sometimes we forget to talk about why we win business, why we lose business, right? We sort of tend to focus a lot on what's currently in front of us in the short term and uh, you know still active. And sometimes I think we miss the opportunity to go back and sort of analyze what happened um, and really do a retro on some of these, uh, you know, the themes and the reasons why, like I said, we've either closed one or closed us business. So that to me is like, that completes the picture, if you will, of what happened to your pipeline. 